Warning, I am about to spoil the entire plot of all seven Kingdom Hearts games in under 20 minutes. I mean, I assume you knew that since you clicked on the video, but, you know, just making sure. So, the continuity on this series is really screwed up. The games were released in this order, but the actual chronological order of the series' story looks more like this. So, there are some retcons and continuity errors and stuff here and there. As such, in order to explain the overall story of the series as quickly and clearly as possible, a few small details will be omitted to ensure that the overall plot is explained clearly and concisely. Anyway, go! Before I start on the plot, let me define some terminology so that everybody can follow along a bit more easily. In the world of Kingdom Hearts, hearts are not blood-pumping organs, but have more to do with the spirit of a person. A heart contains light and darkness, and ideally it contains these two forces in equal amounts. If a heart is consumed by the force of darkness, this person becomes a heartless, a being which acts violently and destructively based upon primal instinct, and occasionally takes orders from someone who has mastery over dark magic. However, if a person has a particularly strong will, their body will remain behind after a heartless is formed. This empty body is called a nobody. Nobodies are, for the most part, incapable of feeling emotion, though they do keep their memories from a previous life. Unlike Heartless, nobodies are intelligent and can plan and organize, and some even retain a human appearance. But living things are not the only things that have hearts. Planets, or worlds, also have hearts, and if the Heartless manage to locate and destroy the heart of a world, that world will be destroyed. The heart of a world is concealed behind a keyhole. Try and keep all that in mind, because we'll be coming back to it. In yay olden times, people started fighting over something called Kingdom Hearts. Kingdom Hearts is basically the metaphysical galactic repository for all hearts that have passed on, both from people and worlds so anyone who has access to it essentially has access to limitless knowledge and power and stuff. So naturally, people start fighting over it. However, the only way to access it is with the X-Blade. The only way to forge the X-Blade is for equal and opposite forces of light and darkness to clash. So warriors from all around craft weapons in the image of the X-Blade that they call Keyblades. This leads to the Keyblade War, a conflict so all-encompassing and badass that it basically destroys reality. However, the light in the hearts of surviving children manages to bring reality back from the brink of destruction. The galaxy is now divided up into many small and segregated worlds. Most worlds are unaware of the existence of other worlds and have no means of journeying beyond their own small lands. Fast forward an era or so to a young guy named Xehanort living on a world called Destiny Islands. Fed up with living on a couple tiny islands, Xehanort finds a way to set himself free from his world and explores the galaxy. He befriends a guy named Ericus, and the two of them train together to become Keyblade Masters. Even though the war is long over, the weapons still linger. Xehanort learns the history of the Keyblade War and how it destroyed the universe, only to have the world reconstructed into what it is today. Xehanort's a bit of a scientist, and this gets him thinking. What would happen if the galaxy got destroyed again? Unfortunately, there's no way to test this theoretically. He's gotta get practical. An aging Xehanort shares his idea with Ericus, both of them now Keyblade Masters. Ericus tells him that he's nuts, and Xehanort departs to pursue his goals on his own. Xehanort takes a boy named Ventus as his apprentice, but the boy turns out to be kind of a pushover. Xehanort tries to make the best of the situation by directly extracting all of the darkness out of Ventus's heart, creating a separate being that he dubs Vanitas. If Xehanort can get the two to fight, it will provide the equal and opposite clash of light and darkness that he needs to generate the X-Blade. However, Ven's heart is left a shattered mess as a result of Xehanort's haphazard operation. Xehanort, unsure of what to do with him, goes to visit his old homeworld of Destiny Islands. There, Ven's heart briefly comes into contact with a disembodied heart on its way to a newborn child. This heart offers some of its strength to Ven, allowing him to wake up. However, Ven is still weak, has amnesia, and in general is not Vanitas' equal in any way. Xehanort leaves Ven to train with Ericus instead, alongside Ericus's other two students, Terra and Aqua. Several years later, Ven has become close friends friends with the other two apprentices. However, a rift forms in the group when Aqua is declared a master after her final exam, and Terra is not. Ericus denies Terra the title on the grounds that he doesn't have control over the darkness inside him. Xehanort, who swears he's totally given up on the whole Kingdom Hearts and Universe Destruction thing, feeds on Terra's insecurities and says that he can teach him how to master the darkness within himself. Terra leaves on a mission for Xehanort, Vanitas covertly goads Ven into following Terra, and Ericus orders Aqua to stop Ven because he's still pretty sure that Xehanort is up to something, and that this is all part of his master plan. And part of Xehanort's plan it is! For starters, he needs Ven trained and strong so that he and Vanitas will be equals. He also wants Terra teeming with darkness because Xehanort is getting up there in years and he could use a nice, strong young body like Terra's. Fortunately, Terra gets wise to the fact that a guy who looks like this might be a bit evil. Eventually, Ericus attempts to kill Ven to prevent Xehanort's plan from coming to fruition, but Terra, not understanding his master's intent, intervenes to save his friend. Xehanort uses this opportunity to kill Ericus. 
Finally, the three students unite to get their revenge on Xehanort. Terra successfully beats the crap out of Xehanort, but unfortunately, Xehanort is still able to shove his own heart into Terra's chest and claim Terra's body as his own. Elsewhere, Ventus and Vanitas face off. Their bodies merge, and the X-Blade is almost forged, but Ventus and Vanitas have a fight inside their own heart, and Ventus wins, destroying the X-Blade. Unfortunately, their fight is so radical that it literally shatters Ven's heart, and he goes comatose. Aqua only makes it out alive through the help of another Keyblade Master in training, King Mickey. Mickey's master, Yen Sid, is unable to help Ven, so Aqua decides to hide her friend's body until he's healed. She also steals, th I mean, inherits Ericus's Keyblade. Aqua runs into Xehanort, now possessing Terra's body. She fights with him in an attempt to free her friend, but ultimately fails. Aqua is trapped in another realm with no way out, and Xehanort is left on a world called Radiant Garden. Here he is found by Ansem the Wise, the leader of Radiant Garden and a scientist with a great deal of interest in the heart. Xehanort becomes one of his many apprentices, feigning amnesia to gain the scientist's trust and sympathy. Meanwhile, a young boy on Destiny Islands by the name of Sora feels a disturbance. You see, the heart that helped Ven out before was Sora's heart, and Sora's heart still has a connection to Ven's. He can tell something is amiss, so he offers refuge to Ven's damaged heart so that it can heal up. Meanwhile, King Mickey is flying around the galaxy and fighting evil and stuff. He befriends Ansem the Wise, but both of them are growing wary of Xehanort, who wants to push his experimentation on the heart further. Eventually, the apprentices overthrow Ansem and take control of Radiant Garden themselves. Ansem survives this coup and escapes, but Xehanort is now free to experiment as much as he likes, and he starts using himself and the other apprentices as test subjects. Xehanort decides they'd all be better off as nobodies, since they wouldn't have to worry about pesky emotions. So they all turn into nobodies, and Xehanort actually gets a special humanoid Heartless instead of the normal monster-looking one. This Heartless decides to call itself Ansem, for the sake of providing a plot twist later in the series. Because doing this recap with two characters who have the same name would be stupid, I'm gonna call this Ansem, Ansem, and I'll call this Ansem, Billy Zane. Because he was voiced by Billy Zane in the first Kingdom Hearts game. It's a layered joke. So a little while later, a lady named Maleficent is looking for a new place to live because Aqua screwed up her last gig. She gains the power to command the Heartless and leads an attack on Radiant Garden. Most of the citizens are killed, but a few, including Sid, Squall, Cloud, Yuffie, Aerith, Tifa, and Merlin, all manage to escape to another world called Traverse Town. A young girl named Kyrie is temporarily lost in the void between worlds, but she eventually washes up on the shore of Destiny Islands, suffering amnesia and knowing nothing of the world she came from. Fast forward 10 years. The Heartless are spreading en masse and destroying an unprecedented amount of worlds. King Mickey, now a Keyblade Master, departs to try and find the source of the issue, and dispatches his court magician, Donald Duck, and the captain of the Royal Knights, Goofy, to find another Keyblade wielder who could help fight against whatever malignant force is at work. He hopes that this Keyblade wielder will be able to protect what worlds remain by sealing off the keyholes to these worlds. You remember keyholes, right? The hearts of all worlds are behind them? I know it's hard to keep track of this, but I'm trying to explain everything quickly, alright? Elsewhere, Kairi has become best friends with Sora and another boy named Riku, and all three of them dream of seeing other worlds, just like someone else we've talked about. Unfortunately, the Heartless destroy Destiny Islands, and Sora wakes up on Traverse Town, unsure if anyone else from his home even made it out alive. In the last ten years, Traverse Town has turned into a refugee camp of sorts for those whose worlds have been destroyed by the Heartless. Sora soon discovers he has gained the ability to wield a Keyblade, and Donald and Goofy find him and convince him to accompany them on their adventure. They discover that the Keyblade can be used to seal a world's keyhole, meaning they can protect worlds from being destroyed by the Heartless. They travel around sealing the keyholes of various worlds, and Sora doesn't give up hope that his friends are still out there somewhere. Eventually, they bump into Riku, who is now working for Maleficent in hopes of restoring Kairi's heart. See, he managed to find Kairi's body, but for some reason her heart has gone missing in the aftermath of Destiny Island's destruction, leaving her effectively lifeless. But wait, you may be saying, when someone loses their heart, don't they become a nobody or some junk? Well, you're right! You see, unbeknownst to Sora or Riku or even Kairi herself, Kairi is one of the seven princesses of heart. Seven maidens whose hearts are full of pure light, they have no darkness inside them. As such, Kairi is incapable of generating a heartless or a nobody. Maleficent wants to get Kairi's heart back since she's gonna use all seven princesses to access kingdom hearts. Yeah, a long story on how that one works, I won't get into it. The heroes head to the ruins of Radiant Garden and beat up Maleficent, but as Sora reaches Kairi, he's cut off by Riku, who is looking especially evil and possessed today. Turns out Billy Zane was actually behind Maleficent's whole scheme to access Kingdom Hearts, and he was using her to continue to work his original self, Xehanort, was so hell-bent on. Billy Zane reveals that Kairi's heart wound up inside Sora during the destruction of Destiny Islands. Sora uses a special weapon to release both his and Kairi's hearts from his body. Remember this because this is super important. 
Kairi's heart returns to her body, but Sora is transformed into a heartless. Riku breaks free of Billy Zane's control long enough to hold him back, allowing Donald, Goofy, and Kairi to escape. The heartless form of Sora catches up, and Kairi restores him to his human form, because she's a princess of heart and has light magic? Man, I don't know, just roll with it. Billy Zane banishes Riku to the realm of darkness. Fortunately for Riku, King Mickey is already there as part of his mission to stop Billy Zane. He asks Riku to team up with him. The heroes discover that Billy Zane is destroying worlds to summon, you guessed it, Kingdom Hearts. Specifically, he is after one of three Kingdom Heartses. Oh yeah, did I forget to mention there are three of these things? Well, there's the one true Kingdom Hearts, the one we've been talking about previously that's a repository for all the hearts of worlds and people. But there's two lesser Kingdom Heartses, one that contains the hearts of all worlds and one that contains the hearts of all men. Look, man, don't ask me, ask the people who wrote this game. The destruction of so many worlds has created a wasteland called the End of the World, a dark conglomeration of all the worlds the Heartless have destroyed. Once enough worlds are destroyed, and thusly enough of them are all gathered in one compact place, a door that leads to the hearts of all worlds will appear. Billy Zane believes that everything at its base nature is dark and evil and so on, and thusly reasons that Kingdom Hearts should be full of darkness. He's in for a nasty shock when he opens the door and is killed by a direct blast of light. Haha, <laughs> idiot, killed by the power of peace and love. But as it turns out, Kingdom Hearts is actually in the realm of darkness somewhere, and there's now an open door leading right to it. Just as a bunch of powerful Heartless from the realm of darkness come lumbering towards the other side, Riku and King Mickey show up. Turns out this door can only be locked from both sides. Mickey and Riku seal themselves on one side, while Sora locks it from the other. Now that they've killed Billy Zane, destroyed the end of the world, and sealed up Kingdom Hearts, the worlds that were destroyed by the Heartless spring back to life. Kairi has to go home without Sora, though, who aims to find and rescue Mickey and Riku alongside Donald and Goofy. Okay, so remember how I told you that this was important? Well, when Sora and Kairi's hearts left Sora's body, that actually created two separate nobodies. They're both weirder than normal nobodies, though. The one generated by Kairi's heart is a girl named Namine. Since princesses of heart normally can't even make nobodies, she winds up with some weird powers. She can manipulate the memories of Sora and those important to him. Also, unlike other nobodies, she actually has... feelings... maybe? It's unclear. The other one is Roxas, who is generated by Sora's heart and Ven's heart, which, remember, was inside of Sora's heart, and yeah, I know, my brain is about ready to collapse too. Since Ven's heart was involved, Roxas looks exactly like Ven. Also, he has... feelings... maybe? It's unclear. By this point, all of those apprentices from way back when have been nobodies for about 10 years. After a decade of not being able to feel emotion, they've decided that maybe this wasn't their best decision. They, along with other nobodies that they've recruited, form Organization 13, and they work to get Hearts and Be Human again. Two recent recruits to the organization, Larkseen and Marluxia, decide that they want to overthrow the organization's leadership. For... reasons? and they figure that Sora would be helpful. Marluxia lures our heroes to Castle Oblivion. There, he forces Nominee to manipulate Sora's memories along with the memories of Donald and Goofy. Eventually, they forget almost everything about their lives before they arrived in Castle Oblivion, and Marluxia forces Nominee to plant some fake memories to try and trick Sora into following Marluxia. Nominee manages to warn Sora of Marluxia's scheme, and Sora beats the bad guys. Nominee offers to fix the trio's memories, but warns them that it'll take a whole lot of time. They agree to do it anyway, and she puts them into stasis so that she can put their minds back together. Meanwhile, Riku and Mickey escape from the Realm of Darkness with the help of a man named Diz, who totally is not secretly Ansem the Wise in disguise. Riku is feeling pretty sorry for himself after all the stupid stuff he did in the last game, but the past just won't let him go. No, really, like, there's a ghost of Billy Zane living inside him, and now Riku has all these crazy dark powers. However, Riku beats up the Billy Zane ghost and decides he's gonna do the best he can to use his new dark powers for good. Elsewhere, Roxas is recruited into the ranks of Organization 13. Xehanort's nobody, Xemnas, has become the leader of the organization, and he's planning on getting everybody new hearts using... Kingdom Hearts. Shocker. This time around, though, he's using the heart of all men, and the plan is to fill it to bursting with hearts. Hopefully, Kingdom Hearts will be grateful and grant them all hearts in exchange. Yeah, apparently Kingdom Hearts is... sentient? I don't get it either. But to fill Kingdom Hearts, you need a Keyblade. Double shocker, right? As it turns out, while you can technically defeat Heartless with conventional weaponry, they aren't truly and permanently defeated unless you do it with a Keyblade, because it frees the heart inside the Heartless and delivers it unto the heart of all men. Fortunately, Roxas, being the nobody of Sora, has a Keyblade. Thusly, it's Roxas' job to kill Heartless and fill the heart of all men. Well, Roxas and also a girl named Xion. Xion here isn't actually a real girl, though. Unbeknownst to most of the organization, even to Xion herself, She's a replica, basically the Kingdom Hearts version of a test tube baby or a clone. 
Xion can use a Keyblade because much of the data that was used to construct her is made up of memories that the organization stole from Sora. Once again, don't ask how on earth they did that because I haven't got a clue. Xion starts to have dreams about Sora since she literally has his memories stored in her brain. Seeking answers, she encounters Riku. Riku is now working for Diz, who still totally isn't Ansem the Wise in disguise. Diz is trying to help Namine restore Sora's memories, but she can't finish since Xion has some of Sora's memories inside of her. Turns out that was part of the reason the organization made Xion at all, to prevent Sora from waking up. Riku tries to convince Xion to sacrifice herself to wake Sora up, but Xion can't commit because she's made friends with Roxas and another member of the organization, Axel. Yeah, Axel is this redhead and he... has... feelings... maybe? It's unclear. But after about a year's worth of killing Heartless and eating ice cream, Xion defects to go along with Riku's plan. Roxas defects for his own reasons shortly after she does. However, Xemnas recaptures Xion and decides there can only be one, either her or Roxas. Xion agrees to fight, but she doesn't plan to win. She plans to let Roxas kill her, thusly returning her to Sora. Xion gets her wish. Roxas kills his best friend in self-defense, and the memories stored within her return to Sora. Roxas, on the other hand, finally understanding the full scope of what was going on, goes back to get revenge on Xemnas. Riku who stops him halfway, knowing that Roxas isn't strong enough to take out Xemnas on his own. Plus, he needs Roxas to return to Sora as well in order for Sora's healing process to be complete. Roxas isn't exactly a fan of this plan, but Riku manages to take Roxas down and deliver him to Diz. The two of them trap Roxas in a digital world to keep him pacified until Namine has finished restoring the last of Sora's memories. The organization dispatches Axel to try and terminate Roxas, who is now Axel's only living best friend. Axel goes out of his way to try and bring Roxas back peacefully, but is ultimately forced to try and kill him. Roxas defends himself, and Axel, more than a little happy to have failed, retreats. Roxas finally comes face to face with Sora, and having no other options left, resigns to return to him. Sora, Donald, and Goofy wake up after a year of being asleep. They meet Yen Sid, Mickey's old master, who sends them to stop Organization 13's plans to turn people into Heartless by force. Along the way, they also assist the crew from Traverse Town in rebuilding the ruins of Radiant Garden. Meanwhile, Axel is getting pretty fed up with the organization's crap himself. Deciding that he'd just like to see his best friend again, he starts scheming about how to separate Sora and Roxas once more. He decides to use Kairi as leverage against Sora. Kairi is still back on Destiny Islands when Axel shows up offering to take her to Sora, but she's suspicious. He eventually kidnaps her, but doesn't have her for long. Another member of the organization, Syax, also wants to use Kairi as leverage against Sora, since they still need him to kill a bunch of Heartless to fill up the hearts of all men. Syax imprisons Kairi instead. Sora, now aware that the organization has Kairi hostage, eventually finds a secret path to their lair. On this path, he, Donald, Goofy, and Mickey are ambushed by nobodies, but Axel appears. Feeling remorse for what he did to Kairi, and feeling the same emotional connection to Sora that he did to Roxas, he kills all the nobodies in a single kamikaze attack. As he fades away, he points them towards the organization's stronghold in the world that never was. As Sora and crew make their way into the organization's stronghold, Riku and Namine manage to free Kairi from captivity. Riku and Kairi meet up with Sora as Mickey meets up with Diz, who- Whoa, what? It's Ansem the Wise! Ansem, who's a real New Age, all digital kind of guy, uses a machine he's devised to extract hearts contained within Kingdom Hearts and convert them to data. His machine eventually overloads and explodes, apparently killing him. The group finally confronts Xemnas. After Sora and Riku defeat him, everyone is finally able to return home, at peace knowing that they've saved the galaxy, and there isn't anything else to worry about, blissfully unaware that they're part of a major video game franchise that will inevitably get a sequel. Mickey, Donald, and Goofy come across evidence that Ven, Aqua, and Terra might still be out there, and they might be able to rescue them somehow. Also, Yen Sid suspects that Xehanort had enough contingency plans that he's still totally a problem, even though they've seemingly killed both remaining versions of him. Yen Sid is right, as it turns out that when you kill both someone's nobody and their heartless, there's a good chance that the original person will be REFORMED! Don't even ask me how this is supposed to work, I'm pretty convinced it was only done to bring back fan-favorite characters from the organization. But anyway, several members of the organization are revived in their old human forms. Makes you wonder why they even bothered with Kingdom Hearts when the real solution was just to kill all heartless and then kill themselves. What I'm saying is that this game is stupid. But anyway, aside from the fact that the original Xehanort is now being reformed because Billy Zane and Xemnas are both dead, he can also time travel. That's right, kiddies! Xehanort learned how to time travel from a future version of himself, and... Oh wow, this game is really stupid. Like, really stupid. So yeah, Xehanort can time travel to any point where another version of himself exists. His final contingency plan is to send several versions of himself from throughout time to the same point in time, join a few of his loyal followers, and go back to the original dang plan recreate the Keyblade War by having a small army of himself and his followers clash with Sora and his crew, 
thusly forging the X-Blade and allowing for one final shot at the main, original Kingdom Hearts. And there you have it, the setup for Kingdom Hearts 3 and everything that came before it. Or at least the factual, basic list of things that happened throughout the games. When you break it down like this, the entire series sounds soulless and needlessly complicated. Well, th the needlessly complicated part is true. Primarily because of this game. This game is bad, but I digress. The reasons that I enjoy this series so much, and I'm sure the reason why many other fans enjoy it, are the things that we barely even touched upon in a straightforward recap of the plot of these games. Despite the simple terms that I've described them with in this video, the villains are fun and energized, the protagonists have interesting relationships and character arcs, and the games are bright and colorful. The plot has been complicated, and in many cases outright broken, by its continual expansion over the last 10 years. But in most of the games, especially in the case of the first game, the self-contained story told on each disc, or DS cartridge, is usually a sensical, well-told, character-driven experience that is worth going through yourself. Except for this one. This one sucks.